Thank you so much. It's just a joy to be here today. How many people know whose birthday it is today? Not mine. Oh, no way. If you didn't bring a gift, it's okay. It's the church's birthday. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and it's the celebration of the birth of the church. So if I had time, I'd lead you in happy birthday, but uh, you can do that on your own. We've had a great weekend together. I've already begun to feel like this is home to me, and uh, see, so warmly received, and lots of, lots of fantastic hospitality. Thank you so much. And uh, it's a joy to meet many of you who I've met already who are sponsoring Children with Canada, uh, with Compassion Canada. You are just making an incredible, incredible difference in the world and an investment in the kingdom of God. I want to talk to you for a few minutes on releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Why does the gospel matter in our ministry? Let's bow together in prayer and let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of being here this morning. It's much nicer than the nicest hospital in the city. We thank you that we can gather together and we can worship you and we can learn of you. We can fellowship with you and with like believers. We can turn our hearts toward you and be challenged and motivated and inspired by you. We pray that you will do that and today you will be glorified. Thank you for the church, the church worldwide, this church. Thank you for this institution that you created to bring the good news of the gospel to this fallen world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for thousands of years, the church and, and Christians in general have wrestled with how to address poverty. Because if you know your history, poverty's been around since the Garden of Eden. A long, long time. And even today, Many ministries and churches deal with poverty in a variety of ways. One of the questions that I get asked very frequently by, actually by Christians, non-Christians, is why do you guys have to talk about Jesus so much? Can't you just help people? Now, if you're a Compassion sponsor, you, and if you read the material we send you, and if you you, you've been sponsoring for a while, you know that compassion is in your face Christian, right? We, we are all about the gospel, bringing the gospel to children and their families around the world. Every single day, we bring the gospel to some five million people. Every single day. For compassion, the gospel is a very relevant topic. Let me tell you why. Some of you that are sponsors with us and you've been reading our information and our prayer requests that we've been sending out to you, just a couple of months ago in the month of March, actually on March 15th, we had to close down and pull out of the largest country that we operate in, India. We have been there for many decades. We currently had 145,000 children in our program, the largest amount of children in any country where we work. We worked with just under 600 evangelical churches caring for those children. Can you imagine the pain and the heartache it was for us to have to close down and pull out of that country? And do you know why we had to? Because of Jesus. Because the government of India decided that we were no longer allowed to share the gospel and invite people to follow Christ. They accused us of forcing children to become Christians in order for them to enter our program. That has no founding at all. But you know, someone said one time, if you're ever, if you're ever accused of being a Christian, you should hope there's enough evidence to get you a sentence. And so we look at our lives and we say, if someone ever pointed and says, 
I wonder if that person's a Christian. We hope that it would be easy for people to say, yeah, and here's a whole list of reasons why I know. The gospel is so centered to compassion's ministry that it actually causes us at, at points and time to actually make very difficult decisions. What does the gospel have to do with poverty? Well, the idea that we can openly preach the gospel in our ministry is disturbing to non-Christians, even to some Christians. They hear we share the gospel and they think proselytizing. You know, proselytizing is a dirty word now. It means coerce, coercing and, and forcing people to accept Christ. You know, I'll give you this bowl of rice if you sign this conversion card. And so when people hear about sharing the gospel, that's where they go in their mind. We don't like proselytizing either. That's why we don't do it. We accept people of all faiths into our compassion program. In fact, for every 100 children we register in our church programs, 80 of them must be from non-Christian families. Why? Because our whole reason for being is evangelism and discipleship. We are not about community development. We are not about handouts and foreign aid. We are about bringing the gospel to children and their families. And so we mandate that the churches that we partner with register children from non-Christian homes so that they can have the opportunity than to bring the gospel. While we don't pro proselytize, we as a ministry are uncompromising about our evangelistic focus. As a Christian ministry committed to ending poverty, we will do nothing less than bring the gospel to those in need. Perhaps it seems strange to connect the gospel to poverty. If poverty were simply circumstantial, if it was just a lack of food or education or medicine, then it would make sense for our efforts solely to focus on these things. But as we read the scripture, we see that behind the devastation of poverty is something very, very sinful. It's a spiritual condition that continually frustrates and undermines our best efforts to change our circumstances. In the opening chapters of the Bible, and we unpacked this a bit yesterday uh, at our uh, conference, it was, it was great for people to, to walk with us through that. In the opening chapters of the Bible, we're shown that in, in the world of Genesis, everything was perfect. It was a world in which God declared everything was good. God, man, and the rest of creation were all in perfect harmony. It was a world in which poverty did not, could not exist until the fall of man, until that first sin. And when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they set in motion events that would turn God's good creation, his perfect creation, one in which poverty could not exist into one where poverty was now the default setting of the entire world. Where once harmony between God and mankind and creation, there was now discord. And once the ground produced fruit in abundance with ease. You know, I used to think of Adam's job. <laughs> what a big job he had going out and picking mangoes every day, right? Now, after the fall, he actually had to dig the soil and he had to dig through so uh, um, all kinds of weeds and, and, and thorns and everything. And the Bible tells us that after that sin, we had to actually learn to perspire and work hard. The true origin of poverty is sin. The curse, that curse that followed that first sin is the heart of poverty today. Whether war and corruption, droughts or earthquakes, poor crop seals, or total economic collapse. Everything we see and everything we experience, all of it goes right back to the curse. It's from this curse that Jesus came to set people free. 
This doesn't mean that God promises that everybody that comes to faith in Christ will now have luxury and have everything they need. We live in a fallen world where the effects of sin and the curse remain constantly at work. But it does mean that if poverty at its most basic level is a spiritual issue, in other words, the result of sin's presence in the world, then we know there is an eternal solution. So many people don't like the topic of poverty because all they think about is, is negative things. There's a lot of good news about poverty in the Word of God. There is a day when poverty will finally and fully end. A day when Jesus will return and bring about a new creation, the Bible tells us, when he will wipe away every tear from every eye and all of God's people will spend eternity with him trust me read it in the Bible there's no poverty in heaven this is the hope that we look forward to as believers this is the hope that has transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of children through compassion's ministry over the last 65 years in fact, over 2 million children have gone through our programs over the past 65 years. Today, we have 2 million children in our program. These children represent about 5 million family members. This is the hope that has transformed them, the hope of eternal life with Jesus Christ. This is the hope of, of communities and families who today serve Jesus Christ and are impacting their nations wherever circumstances, whatever circumstances they find themselves in, fueled by the promise of this new creation to come. Because of the gospel, Maria in Guatemala no longer fights with the rodents at the city dump just to survive. Because of the gospel, Harriet in Uganda is not selling her body on the streets to help finance her mom and her siblings' lives. Because of the gospel, Victor in Peru has remained with his family where so many men abandon their families and that actually exasperates poverty. Because of the gospel, Arnell no longer terrorizes his slums in Manila. In fact, you know what he does? He terrorizes the kingdom of Satan because he's now a pastor. Because of the gospel, lives are and have been changed, are being changed as we speak. I told the group yesterday here that in Compassion's ministry, Every single 24-hour period, about 500 children and young people come to faith in Jesus Christ. For every child that comes to Christ, at least four family members eventually come to Christ. I was in Bolivia a while back, and I hung out with 17 of our sponsored children that are now adults. They're young adults. They just finished university. I was there speaking at their university graduation. And so I got, my wife and I got the privilege to, to hang out with them. We did, we did fun things. Now, these are in their early 20s, right? We did fun things like go to a park and go on swings. Because most of these kids didn't have the kind of childhood where you had time or opportunity to do that. We went to a little park and rented paddle boats. You should have seen it. It was the, it was the funniest thing in the world. These, these young people, young adults, acting like little kids. We used to play a game of hide and seek. They had never played it in their life. They thought it was something I just invented. Right? We had so much fun. We took them to coffee shops. We took them to ice cream parlor and said, anything you want to eat. But here's the thing. During that three days, we had them tell their stories, one after the other. Tell me your story. Tell us your life journey. And I, and I started to calculate. Of those 17 young adults, they had been personally responsible for bringing over 130 people to Christ. 
what made that kind of impact in their lives? Because they grew up in the kind of poverty that you see on TV commercials. They grew up in adject poverty. What changed them? How did they get to go to university? How did they get to change the destiny of their lives? And how did they get to impact so many other people? When I asked them that pointed question, every one of the 17 of them shared their testimony, how Jesus Christ changed their life. They thanked me. They thanked Compassion for the education. They were very thankful. We paid their school tuition. They thanked me for the uniforms we gave them to go to school, for the books. Several of them had told about different health issues they had or their family members had where we stepped in and helped. One actually had surgery that we paid for. They thanked us for all of those things. But in the end, they said, the most important thing that Compassion did for us is they brought us to Jesus Christ through the local church. That's how we end poverty. Because poverty is serious business. Caring for physical needs is absolutely necessary. And sometimes God clearly commands us to do that. But to neglect this charge of presenting the gospel would deny that God loves us and lives within us. The poor and our greatest need is not met through good deeds. Good deeds are important. We must do them. In fact, Jesus assumes we will do them, right? But good deeds without the gospel are just band-aids to help that wound. We need the gospel to heal the deeper wound of sin in our lives. Our greatest need is forgiveness of our sins and reconciliation with our Creator. The gospel deals with the root poverty from which all other poverty flows. If we are serious about our mission here or there overseas, if we are serious about releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name, then we must, we absolutely must talk about Jesus. There is no such thing as stealth evangelism. Release, releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name, it's not for the faint of heart. You would, you would not believe the opposition and the persecution we as a ministry receive every day around the world. Lives threaten, churches burnt down, pastors beaten. Our key strategy is the gospel. Christ-centered, child-focused, church-based. And as a compassion sponsor, and those of you that are sponsoring, here's what I want you to know. You are not just a donor. You are a missionary to the child you sponsor. God has placed you in their life in his equation of bringing the good news of the gospel. You are a key part of that. And that's why your prayers for the child you sponsor, that's why the letters that you write are key. They are important in the process of mentoring those children and leading them to Jesus Christ. You are truly a missionary to a family in poverty. So let me leave you with this. If we are serious about our mission, if we are serious about releasing children from poverty, then we must go about it in a biblical way, in the name of Jesus, with the good news of the gospel. It is the only thing that changes. My father-in-law was an alcoholic when I started dating my wife. He was in the military, and my wife as a young girl used to have to go to the mess hall almost every night and take his hand and walk him home because he was too drunk to walk. He had gone through every kind of program the military had to offer. He knew the AAA pledges backwards and forwards. He had had counseling. He had had therapy. But one day, just before we got married, he came to church 
and he came and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Instantly, his life changed. I remember walking out with him to the car. He took his cigarettes out of his pocket. He threw them, said, I don't need that anymore. He went home and cleaned out his fridge, said, I'm not going to have that. And I'm going like, what a waste of all the time you spent in these meetings and therapy. Why didn't you come to Jesus 20 years ago, right? But the point I'm making is these Band-Aids, which work for some and, and are helpful, none of these changed his life or his destiny. Only the gospel did that, that powerful, powerful thing that only God can do. You might be one of those people who, whose life has been radically changed by the gospel. If you're not, you probably know somebody who has been, and you probably are still praying for a family member who needs it. So remember, when we talk about ending poverty, when we talk about ministry to the poor, let's make sure the gospel is front and center. God bless you.